Welcome to Forest Hills Church. My name is Pastor Andrew. We are so glad that you can join us in this way. We want you to know that we are a church who loves God with all of our heart, that we seek to grow in our faith, and we hope to serve through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. That is our, our mission as a church, and we want to bring you along in that journey. Uh, and so we welcome you. Uh, it is our fourth and final week of Advent. We know Christmas is just around the corner, uh, but as Christians, we kind of slow down and we continue in our time of waiting. Uh, and so in our, our series, theme for Advent has been focusing on prayer and how prayer awakens expectation. We are a people of expectation. God has made promises to us that we expect Him to fulfill. We have our hope set high, and so we turn to Him in prayer. And uh, we also want to make sure that we come to Him acknowledging who He is. And that's what we're going to look at this week as we discuss the three wise men who come to the, the baby Jesus. And uh, that's where our memory verse comes from this week. It's from Matthew 2, verse 11, talking about the wise men. It says, They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, falling to their knees, they honored him, Matthew 2, 11. And we turn to do the same as we honor our Lord and Savior through our worship. Oh, letter to the Philippian church, he exalts the humility of Jesus as he came into this world. As we light our fourth Advent candle, we remember that this humble king is our king indeed, and it is before him that we bow.
Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Adopt the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, he did not consider being equal with God something to exploit. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a slave and becoming like human beings. When he found himself in the form of a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names, so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Well, today we find ourselves beginning the fourth and final week of Advent. That means our time of preparation is nearly over. Christmas is right around the corner. And as we look forward to travel plans and uh, reuniting with family and meals and gifts and all that good stuff, as Christians, we pump the brakes a little. We slow down. We know it's coming, but we still sit in this time of waiting. We embrace a sense of expectation, and that's what we've been talking about all through this series, awakening expectation, and we do so through prayer. Now, any time is a good time to pray. Any season is a good time to preach about prayer, but there's something about prayer and waiting that go hand in hand. Now, as Pastor Cassie pointed out to us last week, The people of God were praying for generations for deliverance to come to Israel. And from our human standpoint, that waiting period seemed to be a very long time. But we trust that God unfolded His plan at the right time. And even now, we believe that Jesus is coming back and He's going to establish His rule and His reign in a final restoration of this world into His eternal kingdom. And from our human standpoint, many of us would say Jesus is overdue. But we trust in God's timing. Now somehow God has decided that waiting is good for us. And deep down I think we actually know this. We actually believe this. As much as we hate waiting, it's something that we instill into our children, right? A sense of patience. I don't know if you've you've ever been around kids or if you've had kids of your own. It does not take long to spot the difference between a child who gets what they want when they want it, right? A term that we might use for that is spoiled, uh, versus a child who is more accustomed to waiting. Now, kids are good at getting what they want. The default strategy of my kids, for example, is to whine, right? Cry about it long enough and loud enough. Wear mom and dad down enough, and eventually you will get your way. And my wife has taken to (laughs) name-calling. When the kids start to dig in their heels, or they start to incessantly ask, why not, why not, she begins to refer to them as badgers. And this, this badgering comes in, you know, in many different forms. It comes in different ways, but it all derives from the same driving desire to get what they want now. We've seen that. Everyone knows Roald Dahl's classic character, Veruca Salt. And in the movie, she sang the song, I don't care how, I want it now. And everyone agrees that she was a bad egg. Now, our Heavenly Father's not interested in having a bunch of bad eggs for children. right? He does not want to spoil us. So more often than not, we are asked to wait. And the writer of Hebrews acknowledges in Hebrews 6, verse 8, that we inherit the promises of God through faith and patience. James compares us to farmers who wait patiently for the rain to come. Uh, These farmers look forward to the precious fruit 
that will be produced. They live in expectation. James then lets us know that we too must wait patiently and we must strengthen our resolve as we wait for the return of our Lord Jesus. Paul encourages us through his word to the Roman church. He calls us even to have patience in troubling times. And these hard times initiate a chain reaction for those of us who follow after Jesus. He writes in Romans 5.3, Trouble produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And of course, we cannot hope in what we can see. Just as we cannot wait for something we already have. And so as we wait, we pray. But what is the posture of that waiting? What is our mode, our form? Waiting, like the complaining of children, comes in many forms. You know, there's the the line at the grocery store or the line at the pharmacy or back up in traffic. There's the waiting for a package to be delivered or a, a repairman to show up or a human being to pick up on the other end of a phone call. Sometimes we have to wait in recovery, we wait for test results, we wait before we go swimming. And some of us are waiting, waiting, waiting on the world to change. Wouldn't you know it, we've actually dedicated whole rooms to waiting. Now, usually, and I'll speak for myself, usually our waiting is characterized by impatience, right? By this deep sighing. (sighs) A little watch checking, right? Some anxiousness. Maybe even some conversations with the manager or the complaint line. But for as much as waiting that we do, we are not very good at it. We, we live under the illusion that we should not have to wait. Um, that we, you know, we want convenience. We want instant results. We are Veruca. But we're told that we deserve it. We are told that we should get what we want when we want it. We might be told that, but we're not told that by God. God says, wait. One of the ways we make the most of our waiting is to be in prayer. For those of us who've grown up in the church, we were taught some very specific physical postures needed before one could pray. I think you all know what I'm talking about. Three things that precede any prayer, right? Fold your hands, bow your head, close your eyes. That's the ever-important one, close your eyes. And once that checklist has been met, this, uh, then, then prayer can proceed. But there are a few problems with this train of thought. The first one being that this model is not biblical, right? None of that checklist is found in God's Word. And secondly, it's not really very practical, You know, does prayer cease when we blink our eyes open or when we unclasp our hands? And how can we take Paul seriously when he encourages us to pray without ceasing if we constantly have our eyes closed? But we understand this checklist to be a helpful guide. We use it as a means to indicate to our hearts and minds that we are about to engage in something important. Right? It's, it takes away some distractions. It helps us focus. So is there something in this idea of posture when it comes to prayer? Well, let's look at Matthew chapter 2. Uh, and I want to take a look at, it's probably a very, it's a, well, it's a well-known story, but I want to look at it from the perspective of prayer and the physical posture of those doing the praying. So in Matthew 2, we read, it's Matthew 2.1. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. And of course, we traditionally refer to them as the three kings, right? We three kings. Uh, Even though they probably did not actually rule any territory, uh, but they would have been considered kings because they likely served as advisors to kings. So they played an important role in the, the royal court. And the term magi refers to magic, but we understand these men to be involved in astronomy, right? In the study of the stars. So though they were Gentiles from Babylon, they were likely well-versed in the Jewish traditions 
and even in Jewish scripture. And of course, we don't know exactly what it is that they spotted in the sky. It's referred to as a star, and it comes to them, it it appears to them in an extraordinary way. And so being astronomers, these men notice this anomaly of this star in the sky, this bright light in the sky, and so they understand it's not normal, and so they begin to research what it could be. And they're intrigued by some prophecies that they come across concerning a certain king of the Jews. And so, they embark on what amounts to be a 900-mile journey toward the west. But even these wise men admit the fact that they do not know all things. And so, in Matthew chapter 2, these wise men ask, Where is the newborn king of the Jews? Uh, It says, we've seen his star in the east, and we've come to honor him. Now, when King Herod hears this, he's troubled. Everyone in Jerusalem is troubled with him. And here I want to pause for a second and ask, why? What is so troubling about a bunch of foreigners trying to find an address for a newborn king, a newborn child? And of course, The fact is, they're not looking for any child. They're seeking the king of the Jews. And this is troubling because Herod is the king of the Jews. And everyone knows it. Everyone should know it. He was the one appointed there by the Roman emperor to keep the peace, to make sure the Jews didn't act up. And he's not about to give away his title. But Herod is no fool. In the face of his anxiety, he remains calm and he hatches a plan. And so we read in verse 4, Matthew 2, verse 4, Herod gathered all the chief priests and legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. And they said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet wrote. And they turned to uh, the prophet uh, Micah. Micah says, you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. They sent him to Bethlehem, saying, or he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me, so that I may too go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went, and look, the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. Okay. These magi, these wise men, astronomers, scholars, They did not know who Jesus was with any full understanding, right? They were not necessarily privy to the fact that God's grand plan of salvation was now put into motion through this child. In fact, I I assume that they had some questions swirling through their minds as they pulled up their camels to what Matthew refers to as a house. You know, I'm sure they looked at each other and, and questioned, could this be the right place? You know, we, we traveled 900 miles for this. There's nothing kingly about this. And yet, one glance upward confirmed their destination. There was the star straight overhead. And their questions and their doubts faded. And Matthew writes, When they saw that star, that that beacon that had brought them all this way, they were filled with joy. Indeed, this normal, nondescript house was the right place. And they enter the home, they see Jesus with their eyes, and they yell, surprise! No. They exclaim, finally! Whoa, what a trip! No. They ask Mary for some beverages. No. What do they do? They enter the home and they fall on their knees in honor of Him. 
their physical posture mirrors the state of their hearts. And when it comes to kids, again, if we talk about kids, even as young as two, I know this for a fact, when they do something wrong and they get caught, they avert their eyes. They do not want to look at you. They refuse. And in order to address the behavior and to have this teaching moment with them, I find myself saying over and over again, look at me, look at daddy, look at me. Right? They don't want to look. It's true of teenagers. The same story. It's much easier to look at the floor while mom and dad are trying to address something with you. I'm going to hear the lecture with my ears, but I'm going to look at the floor with my eyes. That demeanor, that, that posture, mirrors the state of the heart. And so forcing that look establishes communication and opens our relationship because the eyes are important. So we say, of course, You've heard it said that the eyes are the window of the soul and all that. But it's all part of our physical posturing, our, our mirroring of the state of our hearts. And so to bow is quite the posture. And I'm curious to know if, if you have ever bowed. You know, I, I suppose maybe if you've met the queen or you're involved in a certain kind of dance that involves bowing. Maybe you visited Eastern cultures where bowing is more the norm. Um, but we have very little occasion in our lives to bow. And the term that Matthew uses is uh, pisutes, pisuto, which means to fall, to fall. And proskuneo, which is a word that we connect with worship, but proskuneo, it literally means to kiss the hand, okay? An act of reverence, an act of submission. Have you ever kissed the hand of someone? Eden, our, our six-year-old daughter, she has uh, quite a personality. She does things and says things that make her mom and I look at each other with you know, questioning looks like, where did she pick up that? Or what did you let her watch? What did she, where did she get this? So there's no telling where my daughter gets her ideas from, but one of the things that she's always done since she started school in kindergarten is to come to both her mom and me and take us by the hand and give us a little smooch on the back of the hand. And then she turns around and tramps out to the bus and starts her day. Now, I'm not saying that Eden is worshiping us in any way, but she is showing honor in this sort of unique and touching gesture. And that's what's going on here with the wise men. They are falling before one who is greater. They are offering up a heart that intends to kiss the hand of this child, this king. Just as my daughter extends this motion to us as her parents, here these adult men extend this motion to a small child. And here in this little house, Somewhere in Bethlehem, ancient words come to light. Words like Psalm 72, 11. It says, Let all the kings bow down before Him. Let all nations serve Him. Bowing and hand kissing, they are pretty strange in our culture, but not in the heavenly realms. Right? In heaven, we see the angels and the elders bowing before the throne of God. In the Christ hymn found in Philippians 2, which we read earlier, Paul says, God highly honored him and gave him a name above all names so that at the name of Jesus, everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth might bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let me reiterate now that, that everyone in heaven and on earth and under the earth Right? That includes all kings, all those in supposed power. That includes all Americans, even if we are unaccustomed. I would say that even includes all those who have died and, and currently find themselves under the earth. And the, the physical posture of bowing may be an important way that we mirror the state of our hearts. Just as a little kid does not want to look at their parents, 
a good parent will insist on eye contact. And I think it's clear that God insists on the proper respect as well. Um, if, if we don't bow now, we will bow later. That's not the question of if, it's a question of when. Now, is it possible to come before God in humble submission without physically bowing? Can't our heart bow while our body saves us the hassle? I think it is possible. But I do wonder what might happen if you and I took up the practice of bowing. Uh, worship leader Zach Neese puts it this way. He says, if we want His kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, we have to do the things that they are doing in heaven. In heaven, they are bowing. And he issues a challenge in his book, How to Worship a King. Uh, he says, roll out of bed. Get on your face before the Lord and ask, what do you want with me, Jesus? I guarantee it will change your life. It will change the lives of everyone you come in contact with. Why? Because Jesus can work through a humble, submitted heart. That's our goal. That's what we're shooting for. Humble submission. Now, I realize there are some of us with physical limitations, some of us who are just simply unable to bow. And bowing is not always possible. But even still, how then can we demonstrate physically that we possess a humble, submitted heart? How can we conform our bodies to the reality that is within us or the reality that should be within us? How can we honor this King Jesus? How can we live expectantly into His return? So bowing our heads is, of course, a good start. But I wonder if you might be willing to take the extra step and enter into prayer with me on our knees. If we as individuals can bow before the Lord, then this church can truly be a humble, submitted church. And Jesus, our, our King Jesus, He can work with that. So I want to ask if we can try that together. If you might be willing to get out of your seat and bow before the Lord with me. And if you can't, if you can't, I want to ask you to open your hands in this kind of a, a gesture, a gesture of receiving. That we really don't have anything to offer God, but we need to receive from Him. And so I want to ask you to bow your head and lift your hands or uh, bow down physically on your knees. And let us come before our Lord Jesus, our King, in prayer. Father God, You are worthy of glory and honor and praise. Father God, we know the angels and the elders in the heavenly courts bow before You. And we want to be humble and submitted before You. We want to come before You and ask, what do You want with us? What can we do for You? How can we live more into Your plans and give You our lives and our hearts? Lord, You came to this earth as one of us. You came as a humble baby born in a manger. You bowed Yourself before us. The very least we can do is bow ourselves before You, our King, our Redeemer, our Lord and Savior. And so God, we, we come to kiss Your hand. We come to receive from You. We come to submit ourselves and to ask You to guide us and lead us. We come waiting, Lord. We come waiting for Your return waiting for Your kingdom to come. And as they are bowing now in Your kingdom, we bow now here and humble ourselves to Your great majesty and to Your great will. Come, Lord Jesus. Move among us. Thank You for being our King. Amen. Well, as we conclude our service, my prayer is that we would come before Jesus, humbly bowed before Him, 
honoring him as the king that he is. Um, and there's different ways that our church is honoring Jesus um, that uh, you might want to be involved with or invite people to. We have our Christmas camp coming up after Christmas, the 27th through the 29th, in which we have kids coming to our building to hear about the Christmas story. Um, and it's something to definitely keep in prayer. Um, if we're not able to be involved, you at home can be praying for our Christmas camp of the coming up after Christmas. And then we also have a prayer vigil that will happen on Christmas Eve um, between our Christmas Eve services. So we will have a service at 4.30. You can invite your friends and family to come to that one. And then after our 4.30 service, we will have a prayer vigil until our 11.30 service as we do our, our candlelight service into midnight, the, the morning of Christmas. So that'll be kind of a block of prayer for you to be involved with, whether you want to pray at home with us or um, join in the prayer vigil here at the building. You can sign up for that. So we have a lot of things going on and a lot of that focused on prayer because prayer is uh, what we are called to be doing in this time of waiting. And so I want to turn again to our verse from uh, Matthew chapter 2. It says, they entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother, falling to their knees. They honored him, Matthew 2, 11. So I want to leave you with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May your heart bow before him and honor him as your king. Go in peace.